Welcome to a fireside reading of A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Chapter 23. Restoration of the Fountain. Saturday noon I went to the well and looked on a while. Merlin, I was still burning smoke powders and pawing the air and muttering gibberish as hard as ever, but looking pretty downhearted, for of course he had not started even a perspiration in that well yet. Finally, I said, uh, how does the thing promise by this time, partner? Behold, I am even now busied with trial of the powerfulest enchantment known to the princes of the occult arts in the lands of the East, and it fail me naught can prevail. Peace until I finish. He raised a smoke this time that darkened all the region and must have made matters uncomfortable for the hermits, for the wind was their way, and it rolled down over their dens in a dense and billowy fog. He poured out volumes of speech to match and contorted his body and sawed the air with his hands in a most extraordinary way. At the end of twenty minutes he dropped down panting and about exhausted. Now arrived the abbot and several hundred monks and nuns, and behind them a multitude of pilgrims and a couple of acres of foundlings, all drawn by the prodigious smoke, and all in a grand state of excitement. The abbot inquired anxiously for results. Merlin said, "'If any labour of mortal might break the spell that binds these waters, this which I have but just essayed had done it. It has failed.' whereby I do now know that that which I had feared is a truth established. The sign of this failure is that the most potent spirit known to the magicians of the East, and whose name none may utter and live, has laid his spell upon this well. The mortal does not breathe, nor ever will, who can penetrate the secret of that spell, and with that secret none can break it. The water will flow no more forever, good father. I have done what man could suffer me to go. Of course, this threw the abbot into a good deal of consternation. He, he turned to me with the signs of it in his face and said, you have heard him. Is it true? Part of it is. Not all, then, not all. What part is true? That that spirit has the Russian name, that, that that spirit with the Russian name has put his spell upon the well. God's wounds. Then are we ruined? Possibly. But not certainly? You mean not certainly? That's it. Wherefore ye also mean that when he saith none can break the spell? Yes, when he says that, he says what isn't necessarily true. There are conditions under which an effort to break it may have some chance, that is, some small, some trifling chance of uh, success. The conditions? Oh, they're nothing difficult. Only these. I want the well and the surroundings for the space of half a mile entirely to myself from sunset today until I remove the ban and nobody allowed to cross the ground but by my authority. Are these all? Yes. And you have no fear to try? Oh, none. One may fail, of course, and one may also succeed. One can try, and I am ready to chance it. I have my conditions. These and all others ye may name. I will issue commandment to that effect. Wait, said Merlin with an evil smile. Ye wit that he that would break this spell must know that spirit's name? Yes, I know his name. 
and which you also, that to know it, skills not of itself, but ye must likewise pronounce it. Ha ha! Knew you that? Yes, I, I knew that, too. You had that knowledge, art a fool? Are ye minded to utter that name, and die? Utter it? Why, certainly I would utter it if it was Welsh. Ye are even a dead man, then, and I go to tell Arthur. Uh, that's all right. Take your grip sack and get along. The thing you're for you to do is to go home and work the mether, work the weather, John W. Merlin. It was a home shot, and it made him wince, for he was the worst weather failure in the kingdom. Whenever he ordered up the danger signals along the coast, there was a week's dead calm, sure, and every time he prophesied fair weather, it rained brickbats. But I kept him in the weather bureau right along to undermine his reputation. However, that shot raised his bile, and instead of starting home to report my death, he said he would remain and enjoy it. My two experts arrived in the evening, and pretty well fagged, for they had traveled double tithes. They had pack mules along, and had brought everything I needed. Tools, pump, lead pipe, Greek fire, sheaves of big rockets, Roman candles, colored fire sprays, electric apparatus, and a lot of sundries. Everything necessary for the stateliest kind of miracle. They got their supper and a nap, and about midnight we sallied out through a solitude so wholly vacant and complete that it quite overpassed the required conditions. We took possession of the well and its surroundings. My boys were experts in all sorts of things, from the stoning up of a well to the constructing of a mathematical instrument. An hour before sunrise, we had that leak mended in shipshape fashion, and the water began to rise. Then we stowed our fireworks in the chapel, locked up the place, and went home to bed. Before the noon mass was over, we were at the well again, for there was a deal to do yet, and I was determined to spring the miracle before midnight for business reasons. For whereas a miracle worked for the church on a weekday is worth a good deal, it's worth six times as much if you can get it in on a Sunday. In nine hours the water had risen to its customary level, that's to say it was within twenty-three feet of the top. We put in a little iron pump, one of the first turned out by my works near the capital. We bored into a stone reservoir, which stood against the outer wall of the well chamber, and inserted a section of lead pipe that was long enough to reach to the door of the chapel and project beyond the threshold where the gushing water would be visible to the 250 acres of people I was intending should be present on the flat plain in front of this little holy hillock at the proper time. We knocked the head out of an empty hogshead and hoisted this hogshead to the flat roof of the chapel where we clamped it down fast, poured in gunpowder till it lay loosely an inch deep on the bottom. Then we stood up rockets in the hogshead as thick as they could loosely stand, all the different breeds of rockets there are, and they made a portly and imposing sheaf, I can tell you. We grounded the wire of a pocket electrical battery into that powder. We placed a whole magazine of Greek fire on each corner of the roof, blue on one corner, green on another, red on another, and purple on the last, and grounded a wire in each. About two hundred yards off in the flat, we built a pen of scantlings about four feet high and laid planks on it, and so made a platform. We covered it with swell tapestries borrowed for the occasion and topped it off with the abbot's own throne. 
When you're going to do a miracle for an ignorant race, you want to get in every detail that will count. You want to make all the properties impressive to the public eye. You want to make matters comfortable for your head guest. Then you can turn yourself loose and play your effects for all they are worth. I know the value of these things, for I know human nature. You can't throw too much style into a miracle. It costs trouble and work and sometimes money, but it pays in the end. Well, we brought the wires to the ground at the chapel and then brought them under the ground to the platform and hid the batteries there. We put a rope fence a hundred feet square around the platform to keep off the common multitude and that finished the work. My idea was doors opened at 10.30, performance to begin at 11.25 sharp. I wished I could charge admission, but of course that wouldn't answer. I instructed my boys to be in the chapel as early as ten before anybody was around and be ready to man the pumps at the proper time and make the fur fly. Then we went home to supper. The news of the disaster to the well had traveled far by this time, and now for two or three days a steady avalanche of people had been pouring into the valley. The lower end of the valley was become one huge camp. We should have a good house, no question about that. Criers went the rounds early in the evening, announced the coming attempt, which put every pulse up to fever heat. They gave notice that the abbot and his official suite would move in state and occupy the platform at 10.30, up to which time all the region which was under my ban must be clear. The bells would then cease from tolling, and this sign should be permission to the multitude to close in and take their places. I was at the platform, and all ready to do the honors, when the abbot's solemn procession hove in sight, which it did not do till it was nearly to the rope fence, because it was a starless black night, and no torches permitted. With it came Merlin, and took a front seat on the platform. He was as good as his word, for once. One could not see the multitudes banked beyond the ban, but they were there just the same. The moment the bells stopped, those banked masses broke and poured over the line like a vast black wave, and for as much as a half hour it continued to flow, and then it solidified itself, and you could have walked upon a pavement of human heads to, well, miles. We had a solemn stage wait now for about twenty minutes, a thing I had counted on for effect. It's always good to let your audience have a chance to work up its expectancy. At length, out of the silence, a noble Latin chant, men's voices, broke and swelled up and rolled away into the night, a majestic tide of melody. I had put that up, too, and it was one of the best effects I've ever, ever invented. When it was finished, I stood up on the platform and extended my hands abroad for two minutes with my face uplifted. That always produces a dead hush, and then slowly pronounced this ghastly word with a kind of awfulness which caused hundreds to tremble and many women to faint. Constantinopolitani Sherdu Delsac Spefan Maserges Ellerschaft. Just as I was moaning out the closing hunks of that word, I touched off one of my electric connections, and all that murky world of people stood revealed in a hideous blue glare. It was immense, that effect. Lots of people shrieked, women curled up and quit in every direction, foundlings collapsed by platoons. 
The abbot and the monks crossed themselves nimbly, and their lips fluttered with agitated prayers. Merlin held his grip, but he was astonished clear down to his corns. He had never seen anything to begin with that before. Now was the time to pile in the effects. I lifted my hands and groaned out this word as if it were in agony. Nihilisten dynamite theater cast. Change spring on Saturn date fair so kungun. And turned on the red fire. You should have heard that Atlantic of people moan and howl when the crimson hell joined the blue. After sixty seconds, I shouted, Transvaal, Drippentrop, and transport, trample their treba, throngs on sand on tragedie, and lit up the green fire after waiting only forty seconds this time. I spread my arms abroad and thundered out the devastating syllables of this word of words. Mecca, musel, man and mass and mention, moeder, more and mutter, marmor, monument and masher. And whirled on the purple glare. There they were, all going at once, red, blue, green, purple. Four furious volcanoes pouring vast clouds of radiant smoke aloft and spreading a blinding rainbow noonday to the furthest confines of that valley. In the distance one could see that fellow on the pillar standing rigid against the background of sky. His seesaw stopped for the first time in twenty years. I knew the boys were at the pump now and ready, so I said to the abbot, The time is come, father. I am about to pronounce the dread name and command the spell to dissolve. You want to brace up and take hold of something? Then I shouted to the people, Behold! In another minute, the spell will be broken, or no mortal can break it. If it break, all will know it, for you will see the sacred water gush from the chapel door. I stood a few moments to let the hearers have a chance to spread my announcement to those who couldn't hear, and so convey it to the furthest ranks. Then I made a grand exhibition of extra posturing and gesturing and shouted, Lo, I command the fell spirits that possess the holy fountain to now disgorge into the skies all the internal fires that still remain in him and straightway dissolve his spell and flee hence to the pit. There to lie bound a thousand years. By his own dread name, I command it. Bugo Woodga Jilly Then I touched off the hogshead of rockets, and a vast fountain of dazzling lances of fire vomited itself toward the zenith with a hissing rush and burst in mid-sky into a storm of flashing jewels. One mighty groan of terror started up from the massed people, then suddenly broke into a wild hosanna of joy, for there, plain and fair in the uncanny glare, they saw the freed water leaping forth. The old abbot could not speak a word for tears and the chokings in his throat. Without utterance of any sort, he folded me in his arms and mashed me. It was more eloquent than speech, and harder to get over, too, in a country where there were really no doctors that were worth a damaged nickel. You should have seen those acres of people throw themselves down in that water and kiss it, 
kiss it and pet it and fondle it and talk to it as if it were alive and welcome it back with the dear names they gave their darlings, just as if it had been a friend who was long gone away and lost and was come, come home again. Yeah, it was pretty to see and made me think more of them than I had done before. I sent Merlin home on a shutter. He had caved in and gone down like a landslide when I pronounced that fearful name and had never come to since. He never had heard that name before, neither had I, but to him it was the right one. Any jumble would have been the right one. He admitted it afterward, that that spirit's own mother could not have pronounced that name better than I did. He never could understand how I survived it, and I didn't tell him. It is only young magicians that give away a secret like that. Merlin spent three months working enchantments to try to find out the deep trick of how to pronounce that name and outlive it. But he didn't arrive. When I started to the chapel, the populace uncovered and fell back reverently to make a wide way for me as if I'd been some kind of a superior being, and I was. I was aware of that. I took along a night shift of monks and taught them the mystery of the pump and set them to work, for it was plain that a good part of the people out there were going to sit up with the water all night. Consequently, it was but right that they should have all they wanted of it. To those monks, that pump was a good deal of a miracle itself, and they were full of wonder over it and of admiration, too, of the exceeding effectiveness of its performance. It was a great night, an immense night. There was reputation in it. I could hardly get to sleep for glorying over it. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it, too. I certainly did. We'll read tomorrow at the same time and place. Five Pacific at Fireside Reading on Instagram. I can't wait. I hope you join me. Until then, everyone do stay very, very well indeed. Goodbye.